to the Peter Feely Experience, show number six. I'm Peter Feely and I'm Craig Smith. This is really an overflow from show five because we were talking about a few weeks ago I went into Leicester and I did the talk on the Sunday at the start of the uh, Mod Shaping the Generation event. So basically this show is dedicated to my my talk and then our on location interview that happened after my talk. Fantastic. Roll the film. Good morning and welcome to Leicester's New Walk Museum. I'm Dr Jenny Gilbert. I am a fashion and cultural historian. I work as a lecturer in design cultures at Dimoford University. So I was absolutely thrilled when Christina got in touch to ask me to introduce the two speakers that we have lined up for you this morning. Um, I'm a huge fan of 1960s fashion, 1960s culture in general. So to see all of this kind of laid out, I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. Um, so our first speaker this morning is Peter Feely, who is a collector of men's psychedelic fashion. Um, and this is really exciting. Menswear in general is underrepresented in museums. You go to museum collections and there's just not much of it there. And there are multiple sort of explanations and theories as to why this is. One of the first ones is that, well, you know, men wear stuff until it falls apart and then throw it away. So no one thinks to preserve this. That's just one ex explanation. The other is that men's fashion maybe just isn't worth collecting. We don't see the same sort of drastic shifts in cut, in colour, in style, in pattern. Now, I'm not completely convinced by this theory. Um, the argument goes that in the 18th century, fashion underwent something called the Great Masculine Renunciation. Okay? It's this idea that, that men rejected fashion in the wake of the rise of dandyism, embodied by none other than both women. It stopped being about sort of ostentatious shows of wealth, display, flamboyance, and became about sort of subtle indicators that you were in the know. You didn't have to dress in a showy or ostentatious way. You could just have the best cut jacket in the room. And that would speak more, more about you as an individual than say if you had a flamboyant or elaborate kind of garment. Now, I find that interesting, but when we get to the 1960s, I think that theory begins to unravel a little bit. Because, let's be honest, none of this is exactly what we could describe as perhaps understated. <laughs> um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what Peter has to say about his experiences collecting menswear. And also what kind of brought you to that point as well. Um, it would be really fascinating to hear from a personal level about that as well. So without further ado, without me uh, rambling on any further, Peter Feeley. Thank you for that and This is like your classic frock coat with like a Regency collar. So you've got like cotton with velvet pocket flaps, lapels and cuff. So if I open it up, it came with matching trousers. So uh, it's important to say as well, a lot of this stuff I wear, you know, I'm, I'm not like a stamp collector. You know, it, no, it, I'm, 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 if I can, you know, if I can, if it fits and I can wear it, I'll, I'll wear it. So they're the they're the matching trousers that, that go with this. And with a with a, a lot of this clothing, like a shop like Take Six was basically a, a, a shop that was hanging on to the um, trends. They weren't setting them. You know, you had a lot of places like Lord John that weren't the innovators, they were jumping in on it. So when someone was making it, then they'd jump on the bandwagon. But even this was classed as cheaper to say the, the King's Road boutiques. But even the quality of these things is stunning. Yeah. You know, like to, to, to today's tailoring, it's on a different level. And obviously this, the clothing, you know, um, lasted the test of time because most of the stuff is still in fantastic condition. So that's a, a Lord John when it takes its, um, frock coat and matching trousers. Can everyone everyone see okay? And this is a similar kind of cut as the Take Six and this has got matching matching trousers. Wow. The actual trousers on these are like a bumpster. They're not even a hipster, they you know they're kind of <laughs> and um, 
no belt loops either, so you bend down and it's, 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 uh, it's safe to say I wear the jacket, but I don't really wear the uh, oh. what the trousers. This, <laughs> yeah. this is cotton as well. Nice back bend. So that's Irving Sellers. The, 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 the first two were both, um, they both had shops on Carnaby Street and Irving Sellers actually, within the boutiques, had the most. There was, I think, at its peak, there was 24 boutiques in and around London of Irving Sellers. And actually, the, the, the actual, from the mid-60s, Irving Sellers started a, a label called Mates, where he started doing female stuff as well. But yeah, I'll go into that, that side of things when I do the more in-depth one. And then another little fact tip bit, the Shard in London, that was Irvin Seller's design. He went on to, he was an architect, so, so he went from 60s fashion into designing iconic buildings. The next one, the Velvet Suit from Granny Takes a Trip, which is most probably the most iconic of all, of all the boutiques. In the velvet, chocolate brown, that had this had an ink pen on at some point. <laughs> <laughs> oh but they're nice little things yeah. as well, you know, it's part of this, you know, I thought for years, you know, like when you get a car, you've got a log book, so you kind of know the history of an old car. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, you know, in hindsight, clothing had log books, so you could actually, you know, you know, you, you get to know who wore it and, you know, where they were from. And so that's a nice velvet one. And, and also the velvet, from back in the 60s is just a totally different quality to what the, what you get now. The the um, the weight it's, it's just amazing. Your single bat vent, 12 inches. It's still in beautiful condition. And that's your iconic Granny Takes Trip logo. There was there was two there was like two eras to Granny Takes Trip. There's the grey label and the red red label. Again, the um, trousers are quite a low right, <coughs> low waist hipster, bit 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 more flary, but again in, in superb condition, and the tailoring is just beautiful. <coughs> so that's um, in cotton. So it's a great it's a trick. It's got nice darted um, back vents. So this is this is when the, you know the. The, the brave man was, you know, like brave enough to go into the uh, the, the, the dandy look, which is now recognised as the peacock revolution. So, inside it's satin lined and in, in fun, fantastic condition. This is actually quite light, actually, really, compared to some of my uh, jackets. This would have come out, maybe, most probably, 67, on the back of Granny Takes a Trip when they were starting to do a lot of. Um, jackets and shirts in the William Morris patterns. So, like I say, places like Nor John were always copying what you know, like places like Granny, Ch Granny Takes a Trip started with, and always at a much lower price because Granny Takes a Trip. You know, I, I say to people, it the, back then the only people that could actually afford to buy in there were pop stars, or or because it was situated in Chelsea. Chelsea people, you're not, you, your, normal, your normal person would be frightened to even go in there because the, the prices were pretty scary and also the, the people that worked in there were quite intimidating as well if they, you know, if they felt that you didn't have the money they <laughs> just looked down at you. And there's some great stories about even when the Beatles first were in there and they weren't even, you know, they were all sat down kind of smoking whatever, cigarettes <laughs> and, John, and, and John and Paul walked in and they weren't interested, but then when they heard that Beatles accent, you know, they looked up and then, oh, wow, it's the Beatles. But that just kind of gives you an inkling what what they were like. You know, rather stuck up, really, for expensive clothing. So look, places like Lord John, Irving, Take Six were making cheaper versions. But, but Carnaby Street wasn't cheap either, but it was, you know, it was a lot more accessible to, you, 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 the, you know, the working person. Upper Booty garments were very limited. I spoke to Majid that made this. Garments like this, they either made two or three at the most. And uh, again, really expensive. So not many, you know, we all, well you might know that in the end they gave it all yeah. away free, you know, that's kind of well known. Because a lot of people couldn't afford it, which is ironic in the end they gave it away for nothing. 
silk lining, like in, and there's the, um, the Apple Boutique logo. Wow. Which is, yeah. So yeah, it's like beautiful, like mint condition. Really, really heavy as well. I actually wore this <coughs> in London a couple of weeks ago, so I wore this out. We went to see hair, which was ironic. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I had this on, and I think I was the star of the show. Like, so many people were coming up to us. And look, this is more a, a, um, a balloon sleeve with three button puffs. So in, like, like most of the clothing, in fantastic condition. <coughs> Nor Kitchener Union Jack, nor Kitchener Ad. So a few boutiques, and really speaking, they were just start to make a fast book, and you know, I'll, so they were making Union Jacks in everything from alarm clocks to. <laughs> but they are they're actually really rare now. Well, like a lot of this stuff now, it's it's so hard to come by, and and a lot of this sixties memorabilia, you know, it comes with a with a quite high price tag. So I'm really blessed and lucky to have. So, Peter, we've just come from your talk at the uh, Mods Shaping a Generation at the New York Museum in Leicester. How did it go? Um, it was really good, actually. It was nice to be mm -hmm. in my hometown mm -hmm. talking about the clothes. It was really good. Yeah, I, I was quite proud of him, really, actually. He did a really good job. I think it's really flowing quite well, your talk, as it progresses. So, yeah. What was your favourite part of the talk? What was the favourite? Did you have any questions that anyone asked you that uh, you thought were, you know, your favourite questions? It, um, well, the, all the questions were quite interesting, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know, I, none of them were like really, really taxing as in what I needed to say. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I didn't think quite think of anything myself, but um, I think someone asked about copies, didn't they? And yeah, did, did, yeah. Uh, you know, that was quite interesting yeah. question. Maybe just expand on that. One of the questions was a gentleman asked was how how, how many in numbers were these things made in, mm -hmm. and. Um, which I didn't know the actual number, the figure for how many were made, but I was just telling him that mm -hmm. basically on the within the Carnaby Street shops, mm -hmm. they they'd, they'd to a particular garment as long as it was selling, they'd keep on making it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it lasted quite long. How long. How long do you think you were doing the questions for? Or even the whole talk? Was well, it twenty minutes or thirty minutes? Well, something the, like that. It was a good. Well, I think the whole thing was about forty minutes. Mm -hmm. there, there was the uh, introduction, mm -hmm. and um, for about five minutes, mm -hmm. which was. Which was quite interesting, you know, yeah. to hear all these things and then having to, yeah. to take over and... Yeah, and, and it didn't seem that you were too scripted about what you were going no, to talk no, about. No. It sounded like a lot of it was coming off the top of your head and, you know, coming out from your mind and everything you knew about. Yeah. It's easy to talk about, yeah. wasn't it? Well, well, it's like um, when we did the radio station mm -hmm. the other week. Mm -hmm. I just find it better just to not really pre-plan anything, just... Just let it happen and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah, I think it went really well. Before yeah. you came on, uh, Jenny did a huge introduction and really, you know, bigged you up in front of everyone. How did that feel, Peter? Well, um, be being in Leicester and, uh, and some of the audience, know knowing some of the audience, mm -hmm. I, I have to admit, like, uh, I could feel my heart in me, uh, in my ribcage <laughs> pounding. But as soon as I got on and started doing the talk it was yeah it was fine and it seemed to f it seemed to flow well so I know actors do say and, and musicians even you do need that little bit of nerve bit, of course feeling yeah. of nerve to do, yeah. actually get you to do it it's yeah. the adrenaline isn't yeah. it but yeah, it all worked out extremely well I was very proud of you thank you thank no you we were hoping to do this talk actually within the museum because yeah. I've got some like outside where I did the talk it was like a lovely Victorian setting but unfortunately there was too many people around. And Quadrophenia is about to start next door and was making quite a yeah, bit so of a noise. Yes, yeah, so you're getting so a lot, lot of the mods in there. We're so. now in um, Soft Touch Arts um, recording studio, which is nice and quiet, as you would imagine it would be. I think it's all been soundproofed as well, so good for the uh, good for this. Yes, but maybe the maybe the bass backdrop isn't really <laughs> ideally what we would have liked. Well, I don't but. know. I'm sure Floyd would have played with similar bass guitars, maybe. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> Peter as well, what are you up to next weekend in London? Well, we're, me and Susie are going to the Rob Bailey's Beat Bespoke weekend mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're coinciding it with the, we're going to go to the V&A on the Saturday to the Mary Quant exhibition. And then on the mm -hmm. Sunday, uh, me and Susie are going to meet Lloyd Johnson and Robert Orbach. Wow. So, yeah. so hopefully when you were asking the questions about um, Lord Kitchener, yes. hopefully I'll be able to speak to Robert himself and find out exactly what is happening with uh, the Law Kitchener Valet and what's happening. Which is very, yeah, it is very interesting what's happening with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good to find that out, yeah. It'll be really, really, 
really um, excited about meeting him as well. Should be. I, Lloyd's told me that he he likes to talk, so. So do you, Peter? So you know, so you're getting yeah, on. Yeah, like so, a house on fire. So, so it should be a, a perfect amalgamation. Oh, we're a nice glass of wine, though, Dan. Yeah, hopefully, and in the uh, Chelsea Arts Club, which is a nice location to um, to mm. meet and talk to these people. Fantastic. So I believe in June you've got your next um, full-length talk coming up. Tell us more about what that'll involve, and uh, you know how much more detail that you'll be going into. Okay. Well, well, today's talk was was more a a very brief talk about my being into collecting and how I got into the collecting. Mm -hmm. But I've been invited to come back in June, June the 15th, and that's where I'll do a more in-depth talk which will involve um, showing projections, photographs and and more of my collection. And what and date is that? That's uh, like I just mentioned, it's the 15th of June. 15th of June, be there or be square. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll start off with Granny Takes a Trip, and that's when they started then getting prints from Liberties, like using William Morris fabrics and such like, using velvets, satins, ruffles, and they were really, they were really like raising the bar with what, what men were wearing and females as well, because that's an important part. Granny Takes a Trip was a <coughs> unisex booty. Men were wearing the women's clothes and vice versa. It's, like, it's kind of ironic as well, because when I, in my younger, as my mum more vouch for, my dad always called me a big girl's blouse. <laughs> and I, you know, I ended up wearing girls' blouses. <laughs> and this was Keith West's, um, it's a shawl lapel with a brock, it's with a light brocade. This was his jacket that he wore throughout 67. So he, he wore this for all gigs at the famous UFO club, certain famous, like the 14 hour technical dream at the Ali Pali, another iconic events that were happening around 67. The legend was at the time, with um, with to go with the psychedelic drug taking, that if you licked the label of the Granny Takes Trip garment, it would send you on a hallucinogenic <laughs> trip. <laughs> I spoke to John Pierce a couple of years ago and it was, it wasn't true. Because I've, I've tried it myself, I've, been <laughs> three years and I've licked it and it doesn't work unfortunately. So this is this is the, uh, the, the the label. It has actually got a, a mushroom on it. It's incredibly hard to get because, like a jacket like this, back then was about thirty five guineas, which was, you know, like today's money is a thousand pound. These like mere mortals wouldn't even dare go in Granny Takes a Trip because it, the only people that could afford this were the people that lived around Chelsea or the pop stars. The rest of us, you know, had to either have, you know, have it made or, or go down Carnaby Street and, and get a version of it that, that eventually came slightly later. So, so this is like a, a Sean Appel kind of dinner jacket. So when I got it off Keith, we met in London. That, that in itself has got a really interesting story. And I'm not trying to plug, but I do a, I do a YouTube show it's called the Peter Vealy Experience. I don't get any money out of this, I can plug it. And basically I talk more about, in, more in detail about garments and about the boutiques. So that's the first one. So yes, yeah, so that's a, a velvet one. And the label have changed to the, from the grey to red. So that's how you can differentiate between the 66 to 69, and then, and then from 69 to about 75. These are from, about 1967. The label on there is the same label as what you had on the shirts. Because obviously you're not going to get the big whacking label that you get in the jackets. I actually tracked down the guy that made this. And he also made this. This 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 caftan was was um, from Kleptomania on Carnaby Street. Kleptomania, well the guy that's ran it, Tommy Roberts, in 1970, he, he he, he moved to King's Road and he opened Mr. Freedom. So they want to wear that. that. That was another shop that was making a lot of glam, <coughs> real wild, colourful clothing. But when he was working in Kleptomania, when he was managing, he was he was outsourcing a lot of the clothing. 
and this particular kaftan was made by a guy called Paul Reeves. I, I got this off, off the internet and I got this recently because like Sam Pig clothing is, well it's all incredibly rare but then there's, there's um, some things are even rarer than others and Sam Pig in love is pretty rare because of Paul Reeves and his links with Jimi Hendrix and uh, Led Zeppelin. This was bought by a lady called Lana. So when I bought it off her, I got her email address and because I was interested, because obviously if if you can if you're lucky enough to get a garment from someone and it's there the sole person that owned it, they can have an interesting story. You know, this particular lady moved down to London, she remembers buying it, she was really descriptive, and uh, she she was telling she was really involved in that whole that kind of scene, the club, the psychedelic clubs. And she formed a band with her partner. And he had this all about six months. And and he recently Lana passed away, so it was really, you know, it's really, really sad. But she was really she was really happy that she knew that that it had gone to someone that had cherished it. So it's it's always lovely when you get a garment like that and there's a bit of history towards it. So they're all special, but that one's you know got a special place in my heart. It's in velvet, really, really heavy. It's got the classic Regency collar and the wide lapel. I'm sure that's the uh, Lord John label. Lord John went on to, to about the mid 70s. And uh, Warren Gold is still around to this day, still, uh, still got a shop around Petticoat Lane. So I've got quite a few urban sellers garments, but I thought just brought a handful today. So this again is a classic frock coat, very influenced, the actual the pattern and style is very similar to Victorian jackets, but obviously without this garish pattern. So take six was opened by two friends, Sidney Brent and Jack Collins. And they started in 1964, and it wasn't until about 1966 when they became really popular. They were giving them clothing to, to bands as an endorsement, because obviously bands were wearing their clothes. Very similar to how it is today with footballers and whatnot. If, if, um, if a footballer was wearing your clothing, you know, it's big business. And back in the day, if, if, a, if musicians were wearing your clothing, you know, you couldn't get a better advertisement. Sidney Brent had struck up a, a friendship with uh, the Trogs. And this is before they'd had any real big hits. And foolishly, he promised them, he said, if you guys ever get a number one record, all your clothing will be free. <laughs> well, <laughs> wild thing. Yeah. So, the, the, so he kept his words. The trogs were always kitted out. A lot of the a lot of the clothing you see through their tenure as a band is from Take Six. So it's like the kind of period that I like is classed as the Peacock Revolution, where a lot of the men were dressing like Bo Brummel, the dandies from friend from France in the late 18th century, so they were all taking influence from the Regency period. So this is like a classic Regency collar in cotton. And that's the, uh, the, the Take Six label. So the Paws Boutique stuff, you, you can actually, when you look at it, the, the actual quality of the uh, clothing is better. So this is like a beautiful brocade jacket with the, the Nuru collar that Became very famous from the Beatles Shea Stadium gigs. Very heavy, and that's the, uh, the label. This one's from about 1967. It's got lovely double back vents as well. Nice detail for the lads that are into that kind of thing. This is a pair of crushed velvet trousers from Paul's Male Beauty, and these ones do fit. These became very popular at the time as well. The, the velvet, crushed velvet trousers, again like a bit of a kick out at the bottom. You could get these in all colours from blues to greens to golds to reds. When you when you see footage of the Stones, a lot of these bands of these periods, this is the kind of trousers that, that they were wearing. In December of 1967, they opened the Apple Boutique. So this is a this was made by the design team called the Fall, who are, who also did the paint the famous facade on the on the on the shop front. Which got, which um, the Westminster Council decided it was too loud for, for the for the people, and also they, they thought it was dangerous for bus drivers that be looking at it, and so they had to whitewash it. You know, about March, April of 1968. So yeah, like like a lot of garments, 
incredibly rare to get. And with the uh, Maple Boutique, these, um, these silk embroidered labels were horrendously expensive to produce, and it's one of the reasons why it eventually all... Because be, they were just hemorrhaging money. And there's famous footage of like when it, when, it, when it closed in the end of July in 1968. They basically had a free-for-all. They were letting one person in as one person. You know, this nice black and white footage of all these faces squashed against the, the glass trying to get in and get hold of the clothing. So that's some of my collection for you. So if anyone's got any questions on when, when the, the hippie era started exploding, you had a lot of likely lads just on the actual street selling beads and bells. Mm -hmm. no, no different to if you go abroad now, people coming up and trying to cash in on selling you some plastic Eiffel tablet. It was the same then with like uh, the, the love beads and the bells and whatnot. So, is, it one, sorry, is it one piece you're still trying to track down? One piece? Or one, one yeah, piece uh, one piece. Um, I, I've, I've only got a couple of things by, well there's a couple of, there's a couple of shops, there's one called Dandy Fashions and that was a really famous one. Dandy Fashions was on Kings Road. So there was three main shops, there was, there was about ten on Kings Road, but the three main ones were Grand Estates of Trip, Hung On You and Dandy Fashions. Dandy Fashions was the one where a lot of the, a lot of the bands were going in to buy their clothing. The, the guy that managed it, I've tracked him down, I've done a big article on the shop itself. But I, we, we, ha we found a pair of crushed velvet trousers from Dandy Fashions that I kind of gave to my wife. I'd love to wear, I'd love to own some of their jackets, some of their beautiful brocade jackets. There were bands like the Bee Gees in 67 were wearing lovely ingredients in jackets. A lot, a lot of Jimi Hendrix 66, 67 velvet jackets, they were from Dandy Fashions as well. About five years ago, uh, a lady in London had, there was this specific velvet jacket and trousers. She was going to sell me it. And it, was, it would have been the most money I'd ever spent on a, on a garment, but the, sadly the, I was happy to pay it, but the deal broke down and I think it was because she most probably got offered even more money for it. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, Dandy Fashions is one, and um, Hung On You, I'd like some jackets from there. I have my own label and we're making kaftans, velvet jackets, but we're, it, it's kind of, it definitely kick-started a Whereas now there's quite a lot of outlets where you can have these kind of things made, but when I started mine, there was no one. Because he's a dedicated follower of fashion. Oh, yes, he is.